Cleo, you're one of the fastest growing channels on YouTube right now. What is your process of picking ideas? Pitch, info doc, outline, script. Very simple language, but very complex ideas. That is the best step-by-step -step process I've seen to making a viral video on YouTube. You started your career at Vox. How did you prepare yourself to ultimately take the jump? Oh, man. This is an email that I sent to NASA, and it worked. How did you break through as YouTube has gotten more saturated? You know what a good video is. If You're very good at what you do. <laughs> Leo, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Oh my God. I feel like you are setting the blueprint right now for leaving a full-time job to become a creator as you've prepared on the side. And I just have so many questions to ask you that I think people will benefit from because you started your career at Vox. That's right. Tell me about- VOX, not FOX. Yes. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Vox is obviously doing a lot of great things in digital media. What are some of the things you've learned there as you prepare to make your jump and become a creator and have this growth that you've had? And what advice would you give creators trying to leave and prepare for the next step? I learned how to be a video journalist at Vox. I, I still like watch Vox videos in awe because I think their visual storytelling is just, um, helps you understand something because you can see it. Hmm. The visuals aren't an afterthought or like slapped on after you have a script. It's, I mean, I pulled uh, some of your scripts here that I'm excited to go through because I think you're also laying the blueprint for how to script YouTube videos in a way that makes, I don't want to say uninteresting topics more interesting, but you've definitely hooked me on videos that I didn't think I'd click on. And I have, like, we're going to talk about like, you know, like F1 and uh, your know, recent video about the ocean. And how did you think about packaging the show? Because one thing I was really impressed by Cleo is that you launched your channel with a show and a format and something I don't think enough creators do like how did you think about launching the channel and starting huge if true and for folks who are not familiar with it like tell me about that as part of that answer huge if true is a genuinely optimistic show about technology and the mm. features that we can build with it so in every episode I I take a really deep dive into one area that I think is very promising or very interesting or very exciting um so for example nuclear fusion like the sort of practical efforts for that or quantum computing. We got to go visit IBM's quantum mm -hmm. computer. More recently, the efforts to use new technologies to map the deep ocean. Like mm -hmm. it could be so many different things, um, but I'm exploring how smart people are using technology to do something new that I think could be important or interesting to millions of people. Um, and I always wanted to tell stories that way. I mean, even if you look at the way that I was, I was, covering things when I was at Vox, my first ever video was about, oh my God, it was, I think <laughs> it was about crypto kitties. Do you oh, remember back yeah, in the day? Yeah. Um, and the reason why I was interested in that was that I just thought like, wow, what a weird, interesting thing to know more of. Like I, mm. I just became so curious about it and like kept digging yeah. the hole. Um, and so I've always been interested in forms of technology that I think, uh, you know, just spark something and, and make me curious. And so um, the way that I approached that when I was going to leave um, was, or this was after I left, I took about a month to prepare and launch that first mm. uh, trailer and then the first episodes after that. Um, and so oh, I so had- So you prepared the trailer and follow-up episodes before you launched the channel? I had one episode baked. So I was a, I was a one little bit ahead. ahead. I was one episode ahead. Smart. Um, and I also wanted to experiment with actually, it's one thing to make the trailer and say what you're going to do. Yeah. It's another thing to actually do it. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to have done it once before I released the trailer to mm. know that I was right to describe it that way. Yeah. Like, every, like I had to be able to, to over deliver on what I was promising. Yeah. And so I tested that for an episode and I was like, oh yeah, no, this is right. Mm. Like I can do this. This is great. Um, so that first episode was announcing it was called why I left Vox, but it was like 1% about Vox. Mm -hmm. It was 99% yeah. about like why I was so excited about this show and why I really wanted to do this um, on YouTube independently. And I laid out what this was going to be. It was going to be journalistically rigorous. It was going to be genuinely optimistic. It was going to explore new technologies. I think I said it was going to be like Black Mirror, but the opposite <laughs> and journalism. It's a great line. Like that's that's it's how I was thinking line. about it. That's yeah. how I still think about the show. Mm -hmm. My model was that I was going to, um, actually, I think that it, all, all of the ways that you build your career on YouTube require you to make some bet mm -hmm. and then iterate on that bet. Yeah. But if you don't make the original bet, then you mm -hmm. can't iterate on anything. Totally. Um, so you have to like put your 
self out there, decide what you're going to make. If it hadn't worked, if people hadn't liked what I was doing, maybe I would have done something else mm -hmm. or changed it slightly. And I do actually change it a little bit um, in the sort of content that I'm covering or um, one thing that I have personally really loved is field shoots. I'm leaning more into that. Mm -hmm. Like you, you do kind of tack against the wind Yeah, is how I see it. But what's interesting about you making that bet that I think is important for all creators to keep in mind, one is like have a clear pitch for what that bet is and what that piece yeah, of content is. Exactly. And I think the other thing that's part of that is have some, some sense of familiarity that people can latch on to, like Black Mirror, but this. Or like we like to say like how I built this for our show, but for creators. Because people know that. the show like that Guy Raz does, but you can make it for a different niche. I'm curious... Did you hire a team before you jumped in and start Huge If True? Like, did you save up? Like, because to me, when I left my job, I'm like, I'm going to have savings. I'm a pretty risk averse person. So I try to line up a few partnerships and, and just like go into that with some sense of like, okay, I'm starting a business, not just yeah. becoming a solo YouTuber. Did you think about it that way as well? When I left Vox, I was at maybe 400K on TikTok. Mm. Um, and people had begun reaching out for small sponsorships and yeah. I always turned them down, mm. um, because I just, I never even went to Vox with them. Like I just yeah. felt like that was not really appropriate to mm -hmm. having a full-time job. I'm sure that many companies would feel differently. I don't even know what Vox would have said <laughs> about it. Um, but so I knew that there was some amount of demand there that I had been putting off. Yeah. Um, and when I launched, I got, um, in the month between when I left Vox and mm. when I started Huge, I got uh, a sponsorship on my TikTok channel hmm. um, that covered the cost of some of the early Huge of True episodes. Interesting. Um, so for a, and and that continued for a while there while I was building mm. up from zero. Like I um, in the in the first six months, the business was the business is still advertising based, um, and that was almost entirely on TikTok. And now hmm. that's no longer true. It's across all the channels. Yeah. Um, so that definitely helped to have an audience on one channel while building another yeah. um, in a very different way. Like I didn't have any long form videos that I was making on my own. Mm. Uh, and so I didn't have that to offer for yeah. sponsorships. Yeah. Um, and in terms of a team, I before I launched, I worked with um, a wonderful designer and animator named Whitney Theus to mm. design uh, what Huge If True looked like. That like first title sequence yeah, yeah. was designed from the get-go by Whitney. Oh, wow. Um, and she and I talked about it. It was such a fun process that really helped me figure out what the brand was. Yeah. Because, for example, um, we talked about like color choice. Mm. I think all we did at first was title, like font style, yeah, yeah. title sequence, the animated mm -hmm. format that's still in uh, our videos, and colors. Mm -hmm. um, and we use like every color, but those are the ones that we keep coming back to, like the neon green right, and the blues right. and, the, and the dark browns. Um, and every choice that you make about design early on, it's such a fun conversation to have about what your intentions are. Mm -hmm. So I do think this exercise of like who you are from a visual perspective mm -hmm. can be really helpful for people. For example, um, in one of these early conversations, uh, I found myself saying that the way that people art direct almost all sci-fi that I had been watching at the time was, um, and actually no, all technology journalism that came to mind for me was, uh, black and gray, uh, with one neon color. Huh. Like it's always like neon pink or neon blue yeah. or whatever. It's like, I can see it. It looks like Tron. <laughs> yeah. And what that implies visually like it's all about what does it like say to the audience implicitly what that implies is that we're living in like a really awesome spaceship but like the world has ended and we now live in a spaceship <laughs> and like that's it's, like grays it's like metallic colors yeah. um it's very masculine it's very like it gives you a sort of vibe of what the future is um and i was really into i still am really into solar punk hmm. and so the colors and like the images that i showed whitney were like um I want it to, I want like the background colors to be dark browns and dark greens mm. and dark blues. Like it should feel like, um, we still live on earth, but earth is just like wonderful. Oh, and like we figured more out <laughs> and here's like the, a vision of the wow. future that like feels more earthy and like mother nature. And like, this is a, it, it and I'm sure that no one has ever watched my videos and noticed anything like that, but like it's the vibe, you know? And I was, I was figuring out That's what the vibe of the show was yeah. going to be. What is your process of picking ideas? Oh, really um, great. And I, again, I, I have these like scripts that, um, you know, like you've shared, you kindly like shared with me before on your process, but like as you go into it, but you, it seems like you have a four-step process, Cleo, to making a great YouTube video. Uh, what is that four-step process to getting as many views as you've gotten? Pitch, 
InfoDoc outline script. Break it down. Pitch is a, a template that feels to me, it doesn't, it's not quite formatted the way that it was at Vox, but it feels to me very similar where the main goal is to put on paper what the concept is, like the sort of titles and thumbnails that lots of people talk about. Yeah. And then also what is the key visual in the story itself? Mm. So maybe that key visual is a demonstration. You're going to show how to do something. This yeah. is like, um, this is the key visual for the videos that I love uh, that Simone Yetch does. Mm -hmm. Like that that demonstration of how to build something is a key visual. Um, or That uh, we see in the beginning, in the intro. And you, um, can you explain key visual? Like, what a key visual mean? is something recurring throughout the piece. It's yeah. the guiding thing that you need to see in order to understand what's mm. going on. So mm. it's actually not that like first visual. It can be the first visual yeah. that you see, but it's not necessarily. Um, and a good video story to me is like, you know it, uh, you know what a good video is if you and I sat down for coffee mm -hmm. and uh, I was telling you a story about something interesting and the moment when I need to pull out like a napkin and draw a diagram or show you something on my phone and pause it and be like, you see this? Oh. Like that's a good video. Otherwise, it should just be an essay because that's much easier to write. Oh, wow. And so that that insight that like you have to see this in order to understand what I'm talking about. You have to see this. Um, if you're watching Johnny Harris, like you have to see this map and how the map progresses in order to understand what hmm. we're talking about here in this part of the world. Or for me, like you have to see this, like the inside of this plane, because what you're going to see is like the comparison between like the, how this plane works, if you understand it versus like a combustion plane, like hmm. this is why electrical planes can be built in different shape, like whatever. Hmm. Um, that key visual makes for a good story. Interesting. Uh, good video story, yeah. specifically. Yeah. Um, and so in the pitch, the bulk of the pitch is just image, like yeah. put the well, image. Take me through one of your pitches. I have it right um, here. Can you show, to just take okay, me through so what's, what's exactly in a Cleo Abram pitch doc? What this is showing is that you do the title and thumbnail thing. Yeah. Um, I would say that I am much less specific about the, what the thumbnail is going to be. Mm. I do think titles are really helpful because um, they help make you sure about what you're covering yeah. before you cover it. Yeah. But a lot of the time mine will be like nuclear fusion comma explained. Mm -hmm. And then it'll maybe become more specific as I learn more about the topic. Got but it. it sort of needs to be specific enough that I can dive into it. Um, the TLDR is uh, what is the key takeaway from this story? Like how would you tell a friend mm -hmm. about it? Mm -hmm. um, and what is huge if true about this story? That's mm -hmm. the major change for me that's different mm -hmm. is um, in order to make this part of the show that I make, it has to be meaningful and transformative for millions of people in the future. Like, why does this matter for people yeah. and why is it huge if true? And that's um, so important to do the brand work you were talking about early because you can't have a question or right. you can't have the answer to that question if you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then the visual abstract and the visual list, um, the visual abstract is a list of the visuals in in theoretical order, like yeah. if this video um, becomes something that we end up doing, like what visuals do you see in what order? In this one, for example, uh, the key visual was the data comparison between the level of detail that we have of our maps uh, of Mars, of the land on Earth, hmm. and of our oceans. Our oceans hmm. are much more area per pixel, which means much less information about mm. the ocean floor than we have about Mars. Um, and that comparison makes me really curious. Why is that? Like we know so little about our ocean floor. Like how are we doing that? And you come back to that data comparison because it's gotten better over mm. time. And as you're reducing the uh, square footage that uh, per pixel, you're seeing all of the technology that is going into that effort. Yeah. And you're sort of rooting for like the uh, reduction in uncertainty and the increase of information and like, what are we learning? Like, what does that mean that we can do? Yeah. What, are, what are we finding in, in the deep ocean? And this is a successful pitch. This yeah. is like, it has a framing that I think is compelling and interesting. It has a key visual, multiple key visuals really. And then it has something that is huge if true about this story. And so how long did that take to put together, Cleo? And what step in it? Like, is this two months before, you know, you're, you're like, like three months before? This like should be... I mean, if it has a field shoot, it needs to be like three months out. Three months out. Um, so this is like things that are in the zeitgeist, but not breaking news. Mm. That's one of the reasons I love shorts. Mm. Um, the pitch, if it's not with a field shoot, um, it's probably two months out. And the actual pitch document should only take about half an hour to create. But really? you, you should be like thinking about it. Like it should be the result of interest, prolonged uh. interest on like, you know, you should be like, I, I write a pitch doc after I've been like 
absentmindedly surfing the internet trying to learn how much we know about the deep ocean for like you know a couple weeks Hmm. um and like i and and my team are like constantly just sort of reading and interested in things that feel huge if true e Mm. and then eventually something like rises to the level where you can just like write a pitch in half an hour got it so a lot of this is premeditated like you're thinking about it for a while and then how many pitch docs do you guys go through before deciding they're pretty high hit rate because we're getting better. Like um, a pitch doc is a way of showing you that if you can't fill something in, then you shouldn't be pitching oh. it in the first place. So if it's a struggle, it's probably not going to be a good video. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you, if you really can fill out this entire pitch doc and every box feels exciting, then it's probably going to end up being a really great Huge If True episode. Hmm. If you find yourself in the visual abstract and like after one visual, you don't know like where the story is going next. Like yeah. Maybe we'll talk about it as a team and try and find the framing that would would allow it to become easy to to write. Um, and so I would say that we, I, I would say that we do most topics that we formally pitch to each other. Yeah, it's so fascinating to hear about. It. I think this is applicable to a lot of creators because our medium is visual, and there's a lot of good ideas that could just be essays, like you said. Yeah. Um, but I will say that some vi- key visuals are people. Hmm. They're never me. But they are Casey Neistat or Emma Chamberlain or like the personalities that you want to huh. just hang out with and like they're so charismatic that you want to just watch. Yeah, yeah. That's a key visual. Like you're watching them because mm. they are incredible personalities and performers and like they're just drawing you in with their style and their video. So like it's not that a key visual needs – you just have to know what the key visual is. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it has to be – in my case, it is often a chart or like a, a – demonstration or an example. Um, but it can be, you know, something that you're building like Simone or, you know, a product like mm-hmm. MKBHD or uh, just you like Emma. But I think like the the just you or the personality can sometimes take, a, it takes longer to build or like sometimes it takes that confidence to be on it's camera. It's very hard. It's very rare yeah. also. Like I, I'm good at being on camera, but I am not the key visual. <laughs> like that's, I'm well aware, like that is not, that's not. Which, which by the way, I think is, both self-awareness and it's a great way to not shortcut success, but accelerate success on YouTube because that way you're able to get people interested, get higher retention while giving them value in the video in the form of visual as you talk. Yeah. I think that one of the things that I care a lot about is that I'm not the main character of Mm. my show. Mm. Like I am the proxy for the audience and I introduce them to a new main character in every episode. Like the main character was the ocean Mm. in this most recent video Um, or the main character is... Uh, the expert that's going to like show us how he's been building or she's been building some incredible robot or Mm. like there are either expert characters that are like paired with their technology Mm. or the technology itself is the main character. How do you find great key visuals? Because it sounds like that can make or break the video and you may have a good idea, but if you don't have the visual, it sounds like the pitch falls apart. How do you find great key visuals? Oh, that's a hard question because a lot of the time they sort of find you. Like our first episode that we ever did was about um, using technology developed for fracking Mm. in geothermal to make Mm -hmm. geothermal much more energy efficient and Mm. more specifically to be able to be done in much more, many more places. Um, And that key visual was uh, a sort of like cut. Imagine if you cut the earth and then you're seeing the different methods uh, on like a sort of side cut of the earth. Um, And that you're seeing it first for fracking and you're understanding how fracking mm. draws oil and natural gas out of the ground. And then you're seeing it like change mm. to be the way that they're using that technology in geothermal. And you're seeing multiple different ideas for how they might do it. And it's a it's a key visual that keeps returning over and over again. Mm. But I would draw it on a napkin in order to explain to you like yeah, how yeah. fracking works versus how geothermal works versus like what we could potentially do with it if we did it this way versus that way. Um, so if you're thinking about a story, how you would – explain it to someone else is probably the place that I would start and what you would need to draw or show. Yeah. And then once you've identified that, it's like make, frame the whole story around that. What you see is this. Yeah. Then you're seeing this, then that. Like if you're using the word this over and over again, you're probably on the right track. Interesting. It's almost like, yeah, I, I'm, you keep mentioning the napkin. I'm like, maybe it's like the napkin rule. If you need to draw something or you need to pull out your phone, that's a good key visual that you should use in the video and may validate the idea to be worthy about producing yeah. a video around. One level up that I will say is the visual needs to actually help the explanation. Huh. The visual can't just be 
Like if you see a, um, here's the difference. Um, if you see a video of a plane crash from afar, mm. it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about why that happened. Mm. It's just a visual. Mm. But if you see a plane crash and it does a weird little dip and then it goes down again, maybe that dip tells you the like trajectory tells you something and you can reanimate how that was happening and that tells you new information. And like you I have see. to see the visual is the explanation. Yeah. The next level up is like once you have a key visual, like is it answering the question? Is it doing explanatory work? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if it's not, then you have to find another one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm like harping on this point because I think a lot of people just blow past it and then the rest of the video becomes harder to do. Yeah, a, a video, by the time you've gotten visuals in order, which I think is where we're going yeah, next, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it should be much easier to write. The point of doing all this work is that your job is easier later, I promise. Yeah, what step two in your process is an info doc. Step two is an info doc. What is the info doc? Like, what do you see on the spreadsheet? An info doc is a collection of all of the visuals that you think are doing explanatory work. Mm -hmm. um, so in each research section, uh, for example, um, this one is what we already know about the ocean. This should be every depth map that I can possibly find and my uh, associate producer, Nicole, can find and like, yeah all of the historical maps that Marie Tharp was creating and like, where are they located? Oh, they're at the Library of Congress. Like here's, you know, mm. what that looks like. Um, all of the visuals, these are, um, you're probably copying many rows. These are probably like 40 rows long in each section. Oh, wow. Um, and what this is telling you is that the visual is the most important thing. So mm. visuals in order, one in each box, notes about that visual, and then hyperlink to where you mm. got them. Um, and... That means that by the time we're done, like sort of dumping all of these visuals into this kind of uh, document, by the time you get to your outline, you're selecting visuals from the info doc hmm. in an order and like moving them around to Got tell it. a story. Got it. Um, so this is a collection of, this is like, um, I think about uh, making a video like, um, like building a brick wall, like the pitch is like, where are you going to build the wall? What are you going to build it out of? The info doc is like collecting all of the bricks and just putting them in a massive pile mm. uh, or maybe like a series of piles <laughs> of like organized materials. And then the outline is starting to actually build the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about step three. Um, step three is the visual outline. Um, this is images in order. Yeah. Um, and so what you can see here is like I'm describing the visual and then I'm just putting them down. So uh, visual data comparison. This is terribly drawn. Uh, if you watch the actual video, you'll see that it's much more beautiful when Justin does it. But this is me literally going into Google Slides and just being like, it should be something like this and like make it, you know, data correct. But like it should be Earthland is going to be really small because there's a lot of information in very small uh, per pixel. Um, Mars is going to be bigger and Earth's oceans are going to mm. be very big, meaning they're very blurry. Um, and then another example is like this image is um, how deep is the ocean really? This is Justin's like first sort of pass at showing what an animation might look like. Um, and then this visual uh, is me um, again in Google Slides being like, this is make it more beautiful, but like this is what the animation conceptually would look like. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so interesting to see that and we'll put up the final video as well because uh, I, I think we what we do on our side is like I have like a um, PowerPoint deck with a bunch of like brand assets for this show and then I move it around and we tell our editors, okay, for these different beats in this interview, this is how we want it to look and, and then they take it from there. But I think a rough reference point, which it sounds like what your outline is, is so important. By the time you're done with this, the visual outline should become basically all of the important visuals in the middle column of the script. Hmm. So you're almost copy pasting in, but like they're very spread out and you might have lots of other visuals, montages, like yeah. all kinds of other things in between. But these are the building blocks that go in the middle column of script. And so step four is the script, which I don't want to call it the easiest part, but it sounds like with all these three steps you've done before falls into place. It becomes much easier. I will say I spend by far the most time on the script, mm -hmm. but the script becomes, um, it's, it's three columns. The middle is all of the visuals that I'm going to be using. Um, and then the uh, left-hand column is all of the actual words that I'm going to be saying, including like music cues, like sound effects. Um, my editor, Logan, does a lot of artistry with that as well. But if yeah. I have a specific opinion about something, I'll like write it in. Um, interview clips, everything that, everything that you're hearing goes in the left-hand column, everything that you're seeing in the middle column, and sources and notes in the right-hand hmm. column. Wow. I mean, that's such a different approach to writing an explainer video that... Uh, How do you write it? Creators having their own membership sites is all everyone seems to be talking about these days. But it's often hard to know where to start. 
And that's where Uscreen comes in. With over $150 million in membership revenue paid out to creators in the past year alone, Uscreen makes it easy to build a loyal community and earn steady reoccurring income beyond just ads and brand deals. You could even think of Uscreen as a Netflix style membership, but just for your content paired with live streaming, private community, marketing tools, and your own branded mobile and TV apps and more to run a lucrative membership platform. Two great examples of this are Yoga with Adrian, who runs her membership on Uscreen, and Jevin Dovey, who turned his courses into a successful membership called the Creator Film School. And there's a lot of other options out there available to creators, but Uscreen really stands out because memberships is all that they do, and they're laser focused on helping you run a lucrative membership platform. And that includes pairing you with a dedicated success manager, 24 seven customer support. And if you already have a membership, don't worry, they'll even help you migrate your content, students, and payments over. So if you're intrigued, check out the link to book a one-on-one -on -one demo with Uscreen so they can give you a step-by-step -step plan, your revenue potential, and the effort required to run your own membership. I basically write to a PowerPoint deck first. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is just like more of a corporate no, background like coming into play. But I think about, one, I think about not a video. I think about a keynote speech to an audience. And when I'm putting that speech together, I'm thinking about the moments where the people in the audience are bringing out their phones to take a picture of my slides. This is the same insight. This is a visuals first <laughs> yes, approach. Yeah. Like yours is like the visual and then the writing underneath the keynote. But like that's exactly, it's basically you take your format and you just rotate it 90 <laughs> yeah. degrees and like yeah, you yeah, have my yeah. format. <laughs> exactly. And then I think about my keynotes to videos is like comedians think about stand-up sets to stand-up specials. Mm -hmm. So I test it out in front of crowds that I do speaking events. I see their feedback. I tweak it. And I'm like, okay, I have my deck. I have my visuals. And then I sit in front of a camera and deliver it. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting to hear your take and just compare notes because I think, I don't know, I hear so many creators just turn on the camera like, how do you do that? You know? And uh, But it's, those videos don't always perform as well as yours do. It's also cool to hear you think about a live audience because I have basically no experience with a live audience. Like oh, really? my entire I've... career has been behind like solo with a camera. And yeah. in fact, most of the time that I have with a camera, I'm also shooting myself, including hmm. like most of my Vox videos, all of the Quibi show, I was I was filming myself and like hmm. monitoring my own audio and like hmm. looking at my own, like all, all of that. I mean, it was, it was during uh, 2020, so it was uh, necessary. And I, um, that, process has made me like very aware of the relationship with an audience digitally mm. but like we're gonna be on stage in yeah, front yeah. of a live audience yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, oh, you're gonna be that's great. a very different experience yeah, yeah yeah um and uh i'm getting more excited about that but like my primary medium is yeah. video and so what i think about is like that relationship well but I, I think you could create an audience like i run all my material um by my wife, uh, my parents who like are from Iran. So English is not their first language, but they're very smart. So I'm like, okay, if they understand this, then we're good. If not, I'm probably using words that are too complicated or my sentences aren't simple enough. That's awesome. So I talk to my mom and dad a lot when I'm preparing like explainer videos. Um, Wait, actually that's a, a perfect example. You have the, the human experience of um, one of the best lessons that I ever got for writing video, which mm. was um, never underestimate your audience's intelligence and never overestimate their prior knowledge. So in yeah. your case, you're, you're, they might have a lot of prior knowledge, but you're thinking about the wording. For, for me, a lot of that means like no jargon, mm. no, no like acronyms, yeah. nothing that they might not already know. Yes. Um, yeah. So like very simple language, but very complex ideas. Yes. There's actually a great email that leaked from Tesla that Elon Musk sent to all his employees. Have you seen this? The one where he says he hates acronyms? Yes. I do like that. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I do like that. No acronyms and all these other things. I'm like, I wish like uh, this is could be sent out to all companies. But yeah, it's like, the, don't lose people no in acronyms. a train of thought. Like uh, I mean, when I worked at Google, we had a, um, a dictionary of like decoding acronyms. And uh, I yeah, feel like, yeah, yeah, they're speed bumps, and especially when you have them in a video. Um, what are other things like that, Cleo, like that you learned at Vox or that you now have as part of your team? Like that's a really interesting like principle. What are other things that you really think about as you put together your videos? One of the big lessons at Vox um, early on was there was this expression that the head and the hands should be as close together as possible, mm. meaning um, that the person who 
came up with the idea should also be the person to actually make the work. Mm. And that's very, very empowering because the person who had the idea is probably the person who cares most about it, but also who has the vision who like every time, this is the great art of making video and the great art of storytelling in general is like, how much can I like form a connection between what's going on in my mind to what's going on in yours? And like, yeah. no matter how high the throughput of that connection, there will always be loss. <laughs> And so if you have a series of people working on something, there will always be loss in the communication mm. of the vision. Um, now that becomes a, like the trade-off is that other people can make your vision much better. Mm. And so you have to like acknowledge that there will be loss to the original version. But like when I describe these animations to Justin, he's mm. gonna go make them so much better. Mm. And so like, yeah, there's loss in like me communicating what I have in mind, but what he has in mind is better. So like that's that's a cost I'm happy to, yeah. to pay. Um, but I do think that if you are really scrappy and really want like the tone and the personality to come across in the video, having the person who came up with the idea also be the person to actually do the edit and actually do the yeah. animations can be really, really powerful. But I, I like to say, do it before you delegate it. Yeah. You know, and like I think you mentioned, you used to take night classes to learn how to animate. And even if that gets you some of the way there to be able to put together a rough visual and then communicate. Like for me, like I didn't know the first thing about color grading for example, and I'd tell our editors, this image looks flat. Like that's not good feedback to give to an editor. And then I was like, you know what? I should go in and just like work with the, like coloring myself. I'm like, oh, oh, lower the shadows. Yeah, well. Think about the midtones. You it's know, interesting. I, that it's, language. You can go either way. So mm. I've learned that either I can try and make something, like these visuals, uh, this little like, terrible little visuals that I've made in Google Slides are much better than just describing in text what I'm talking about. Like it's getting yes. much closer and so yes. it's just much easier to communicate because I made a terrible drawing, but it's it's close. Yeah. Um, but when I'm giving feedback, um, the best way that I learned to work with designers and animators and folks who have artistic vision for what they're working on is um, because I know they're better than me, I will say things like, this makes me feel like this. Or like, mm. um, because I don't necessarily know the best solution to something, like that's what I'm paying oh. them for. Um, and so I'll say like, um, like this, I won't say this is too dark yeah. or like increase the like brightness on mm -hmm. this. I'll say like, we're not calling enough attention to like, like I can't see that, like I, I can't, um, the focus isn't on this. Uh. Like we want to make sure that people can see that. You and like it's really up to them to figure out like what is the best solution to yeah. that. And then like if as an editor and an animator I have an opinion about what that solution right, should be, right. maybe I'll say specifically yeah, like, yeah. you know, fill right with left on the audio track. Like I can yeah, hear yeah, that this. Yeah, like yeah. sometimes I, I yeah. uh, do know and that's also really helpful is right. like to, to be an editor right. uh, and to be able to understand what the available solutions are so you know like what you're asking. Cleo, you're one of the fastest growing channels on YouTube right now uh, and you've done it with so few uploads. What are the things you think you've learned and and how did you break through as YouTube has gotten more saturated? Well, I don't know if I'm one of the top growing. I, I will take the compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's very nice. Um, I, uh, I think that you always have a choice in what kind of content you want to make. Hmm. And I think for me, um, I was, I had an opinion about what was really exciting to me and what I felt like would fill a sort of white space for, yeah. for me personally, like yeah. what was it that I was missing from my media diet? Yeah. And I tried to fill that for myself. Hmm. And so the big question that I was really asking, uh, was, are there other people out there like me? Hmm. Like, do other people feel that way? Um, and I think that sort of, um, creative confidence for lack of a better word of like what I was I was making things for myself. I was asking if there were people out there like me. Like I was making optimistic technology yeah. content and wondering if there were people who also wanted that. How are you like, doing by putting out TikToks about that? Like how are you testing that hypothesis? Oh, no, I, I just launched the show. Oh, like, so, the so whole that, show that was, was the just way, like a test. That I was, was the like, way that, I want this. Let's see if that, other people want That was want the this. way to answer the question. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like you're pre-vetting oh, or yeah. asking friends or like, uh, like yeah. that was, that was it. The launch was like, let's see if this is. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I mean, because there's definitely a world in which it, there, the answer was no. Um, but I had to, I had to offer something yeah. in order to either be like, um, accepted by some people or rejected. Oh, wow. And either option would have been, I mean, I would have been, uh, upset if the show didn't work. Um, but I wanted to make 
I wanted to make this. I wanted to yeah. know if there were other people that I could connect with in this way to make optimistic technology content and like tell these kinds of stories. And I would have been and am still really excited to iterate based on format and mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. thing that um, is most interesting to people and way of telling those stories. But the mission of the show yeah. was really like me putting myself out there as a person and saying like, this is what I want to see exist in the world. And this is the way that I want to help. I want yeah. to help inspire people to work on um, technology solutions that might help others. I want to show you ways that people are working on yeah. improving the world so that you feel like, hmm. you know, there, there are other people, there are helpers out there. Yeah. And um, I could have found a lot of different ways to do that, but, but this is what I really yeah. wanted to test. Um, and so to answer your question about uh, how fast the show is growing, like for me, the reason that that feels just like, so wonderful and like um really really exciting is because the answer has been yes like because mm. i put myself out there a little bit as a person and i yeah. said like this is what i want do you want it too and the answer has been yes and that's just been really gratifying one of the ways that you put yourself out there is you get all these interviews that really bring another level of depth to your videos can you take me through a pitch email oh my god i pulled it up here like because I, th I think what's really interesting about this email that you sent to somebody to get them on camera and get them to talk is something that any YouTuber could do. Yeah. And I, I want to talk about like how YouTubers can think more like journalists because that makes their videos more interesting. But walk me through this email that you sent. You don't have to read it verbatim, but what are kind of like the checkboxes of a Cleo Abram email to get somebody to talk on camera? Yeah. So this is a, an email that I sent to NASA. <laughs> And it worked. <laughs> um, I can't believe this is uh, real. This is a video that I haven't put out yet about supersonic planes. So go subscribe to see that one when it comes out. Um, but this is me emailing. I'm pretty sure that this is just the, maybe this is one email deep uh, because I seem to know whose name I'm reaching mm. out to. So maybe this is like after I had reached out just cold to their like press email. And then maybe I had gotten a response and then I'd asked for, this is like a, follow-up. Um, so I said, hi, my name is Cleo Abram. I'm a video journalist creating Huge If True, and I explain what that is. Mm. Um, I say that we reach uh, a lot of people um, across YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, um, and that we have featured visits to other sort of similarly um, uh, complex and uh, frankly, like secure yeah. locations. So um, IBM's quantum computer, Argon National Lab, nuclear research, that tells them like, hey, I understand how you work. I'm happy to wait a long time. I'm happy to like go through a security clearance. Like I've done this yeah, before yeah. and I am gonna be like respectful of your, yeah. your needs. Um, I'm working on a video about the future of supersonic planes. I would love an interview with someone on a specific team that I really wanted to, to see. Mm. They're working on a plane called the X-59, which is going to explore ways to make supersonic flight quieter. Yeah. Really, really big deal. And I say, I, I am showing them that I've done research ahead of time, but hmm. I'm saying like the, the acoustic technical lead or the lead engineer, like I know who their names are. And then I say, or anyone else you would recommend. I'm trying to say like, I've done a little bit of looking into your team. I love, I, I love what you're doing, uh, but also I defer to you on on who the best yeah. uh, person is. Um, and uh, sometimes that's sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes I'm asking for an interview with a specific person. Um, and then in this case, I really wanted to see the plane, so I say like, <laughs> and perhaps see the X59 in person if possible. Um, this episode would explore the potential of supersonic planes and explain key elements of the engineering behind them. Um, would someone be interested in being part of this video? So uh, I don't know if this email will meet the criteria that I'm about to say, mm. but the perfect email can be read in one with no swipes on your phone. Uh -oh. So I will literally send the email to myself and pull it up on my iPhone and see if I can see read the entire email in the, in the first huh. box because that's the amount of time that I think I deserve from these people. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and, and if you have to swipe, I'm like demanding too much of their time. Interesting. Um, and so I try and say, we're doing this kind of show, we reach these kinds of people, and I'm asking for this specific thing. Hmm. Um, and I'll, like 90% of the time, the answer is no. In this yeah. case, it, it happened to work. Got it. Um, how do you find their email address? 
We've had some amazing guests on this channel and today's sponsor Riverside has played a big role in making those interviews happen seamlessly. Like my recent remote interview with Jay Alto. What's great about Riverside is that it helps from prep to post production. I mean, it gives us summary notes from our pre-calls, records our remote shoots in the same 4K resolution as my in-person interviews, and Riverside saves everything locally so I don't have to worry about spotty Wi-Fi. I mean, if you're a YouTuber, you know that coordinating remote recordings can be tough with unreliable connection and quality, but with Riverside, you're able to record studio quality audio and video, making it feel like we're in the same room even when we're apart. And your guests can join with just a link. No need for an account on their end or anything. The setup is seamless. But what I love most is that Riverside also makes post-production so simple. I mean, their text-based editor lets you make changes as easily as editing a transcript. You can download separate audio and video tracks for each of your participants. So it gives you a ton of control in the editing room. Plus, their AI features can trim those awkward silences, add captions, and even optimize the speaker view all with just a few clicks. So if you want to check out Riverside, see the link in the description below for a discount code. And trust me, it's going to save you hours of work and you'll wonder how you even manage without it. All right, now back to the video. I think it was like press at NASA.com or something. Oh, like, really? I think Just it was like straight up. Inquiry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wow. And then often that per it's that person's job to funnel you to the right yeah. press person. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're a smaller channel, like how do you get someone as big as NASA to appear on your YouTube channel? Like, what do you say to them? Like, how do you land that? I mean, earlier on, I I wasn't sh shooting for NASA, um, but that's not to say that they wouldn't have, wouldn't have done it. I've been like so pleasantly surprised yeah, yeah. by the unbelievable generosity people show to people that they see as doing something really cool. If you have a YouTube channel that is like perfect for someone and they feel like you are their people, like especially, you know, someone doing research on quantum physics and you're a channel that is like explaining quantum physics to mm. kids, like th they want to talk to you. They really yeah, do. Like that's, yeah. people do what they do because they love what <laughs> they do. And it just like, especially someone who's doing something really complex that other people are not fully understanding, like they want to explain yeah. it. And that I think is like such a gift. Um, I, I love working with people like that. So I'm looking for those people. And if they say no, like, that just means that they that that's totally fine. That means they're not yeah. they're that you you if someone says like not right now, there's no follow up email to that. It's just like thank you for your time mm -hmm. and maybe revisit it in a little bit if you feel like you have something new you yeah. can offer them. Um, so I think being super respectful of their time, uh, showing them why you are their their people and like yeah. why you co would connect with them, um, and it's much less transactional than you might think. It's not yeah. like I have this ma some maybe for e people that are even larger like it's you know I have some massive audience who obviously want to reach them but like most of the time people are doing it because they just really like talking yeah. about what they're talking about mm -hmm. and I just think that's true for collaborations with other YouTubers that's true for mm -hmm. working with experts like people love what they do for a reason so if you are able to connect with them about that like yeah. you might just get a yes. Yeah. And also you got to be okay with like most of the time getting a no and that's fine too. <laughs> um, what were some of those big wins early on that you got? Early on, I interviewed a lot of academics who again, like love what they do yeah, and yeah. like love talking about yeah. it. Um, other journalists can be really helpful. Mm. Um, so in my first episode, that one about geothermal, um, I did an interview with David Roberts, who's a uh, energy reporter, um, who I knew from Vox, yeah. um, and also, uh, an ap an academic who was working on specifically the technology that I was talking about. Yeah. And so it was really cool to have someone who was, who's, uh, narrowly focused there. Um, I got an opportunity, the first opportunity I got to interview a tech CEO was the CEO of Cruise. Hmm when they released their self-driving cars, mm. uh, the beta test in San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, I interviewed uh, Kyle, their CEO. Um, and that I think was sort of, they wanted someone to explain what was going on and to yeah. kind of like contextualize uh, self-driving cars in a way that helped people understand what the different levels of self-driving are. Like they just, and they didn't, nobody ever sees the videos before they go out yeah. they're just an expert interview um but they kind of trust that my goal is to contextualize right. and explain something right, right. um and i just think they wanted help with that so the channel was couldn't have been larger than like 
maybe a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand at that mm. point. But they said yes to that, which, wow. which I thought was really cool. Um, what are other ways that YouTubers can be better journalists? Mm. What What are things that they could do? I'm I'm really excited about that. I think yeah. uh, one of the big questions that you might hear in in sort of people within media companies these days is like, what's the future of journalism, especially given how quickly sort of creatordom has yeah, yeah. risen. Um, and I think uh, one of the interesting questions is how do journalists become creators? But I think another really important one is for creators who want to, how do they become journalists? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of the technical skills that are involved in creating video, like we talked about, yeah. um, are more time consuming to learn mm -hmm. than some of the skills of journalism. Right. Journalism is wonderful because it is not a like degree that you get or that you have to get or like a, a sort of bar that you pass, mm -hmm. um, literally. I mean like not the <laughs> test, you're not becoming a lawyer yeah, yeah. or a medical doctor. It's an act that you do every day. It's like if you are doing the things that make up good journalism, you are a journalist if you would like to call yourself that. Um, what, what is the act? Because I'm, I'm, I'm curious because like reach, reaching out to a primary source and getting an interview is part of the checklist of how YouTubers can become better journalists, which I think is how do you make better content? Yeah. Seeing a primary source versus pulling from something else that people have seen is just more interesting. What's that checklist of how YouTubers can do more of that to become journalists in their videos? You know, I think a lot of this goes hand in hand with uh, ways that people themselves can be better news consumers, but yeah. it's like checking your sources, um, being clear about what you've learned and from whom. Sometimes I'll even say, in my very first video, this is something that I've felt more comfortable experimenting with actually independently. Yeah. In my very first video I said, I've spent about a month researching this, like this is what I have found. Mm. Um, if you are an expert, it was a, a sort of complex technical point yeah, about yeah. fracking. I said, if you are an expert in fracking, I'd love to continue this conversation. Like uh, I was able to unearth this, like I'm being honest about where I am in yeah. my you're not My at the process. conclusion of the process. And also, like, I'm not able to become an expert in fracking in every yeah. episode. I'm featuring someone who is, and I am I am doing a service to fit parts of a puzzle together. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm an expert. Hmm. And that, I think, is something that is core to journalism, is, like, that humility and yeah. that desire to genuinely present the truth. Um, I do a... a a sort of fairly specific, optimistic take hmm. as well. I'm not sure that all journalists would see the kind of perspective that I offer as like necessarily a core part or even like that. They might see that as more opinion hmm. than like formal, straightforward journalism. Hmm. Um, I'm okay with that. Hmm. Like I, I think that, that uh, as long as you're clear about where you're getting your information and you are – um, clear about where your perspective comes from. This was the philosophy at Vox that you could share um, all of the information and then what you take away from that information. Hmm. That's also okay to share. As the person behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Like it just, yeah, I feel like sometimes, yeah, people don't want to insert the I, but you know, it, it makes it's it more human. sort of part of the deal when yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, when yeah. you're like hosting something on camera. And I also see what I do as a mix between explainer journalism and I am trying to offer a specific hopeful perspective yeah. on the world. And so I choose to cover things that I think fit into that category. Um, and sometimes I don't cover things that I have too many concerns about. Mm. Um, and also I try and share the ways that things could go off the rails or like the genuine concerns that people have about that technology or the people building that technology yeah. might have. So it's, it's, I think journalism involves sourcing. It involves, um, a genuine effort to find the truth. It involves, um, explaining that in an empathetic way to an audience. Mm. Um, and, uh, at the end of the day, it involves a lot of humility because like you, you might be wrong. You're not going to be an expert. And like when you do, you need enough, um, you need enough humility to be able to like, correct your work yeah. or and do better yeah um i have a couple questions to bring us home i i'm so fascinated by your process when it comes to long form 
what's your process when it comes to shorts? Because I see you like in those videos, you have your coffee cup. It seems very casual, but come on, Cleo, it's not that casual, is it? Like you're well, when I record, it is. <laughs> the, the... How many takes are you doing of those videos? Oh, like how much preparation goes? That into is it? like I'm recording. Well, I might do multiple takes of a certain line because I I speak quite quickly yeah. and more faster than I talk in real life, yeah, and yeah. so sometimes I just mess up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm recording just like holding my camera, uh, my phone. For me, that feels very natural. I want yeah. my short form to feel like I'm just FaceTiming you and explaining mm -hmm. something like with some good visuals. Yeah. Um, and so I do record on my camera very casually as opposed to, or sorry, on my phone camera as opposed to with my like real camera. Yeah. The stories that I choose are, they don't involve this whole process. That would be overkill, but they do involve like a pitch with a visual um, and then a script. And mm. I have an amazing associate producer, Nicole, who's working on a lot of these. Mm. Um, and we talk about what is the key visual for the short form video. Oh, interesting. Like it's 60 seconds. You only really get to say one thing in 60 mm. seconds. It's like, what is this? What happened? And why, it's, why is it important? Say that outline again. This is blank. Yes. It matters because blank. Mm. That's really all you get. Got it. Um, and this is blank involves a key visual. Yes. Got it. Yes. Um, so... If it's uh, the most recent um, Nobel Prize in physics is one mm. that we're working on right now, uh, it, an attosecond is like you need to understand how small that is. There's a comparison for how small that is. Like mm. that's the only real visual. Yeah. Um, and then like why do we need to know about attoseconds? It's like, well, we're learning a lot about electrons that way. Huh. Like electrons are important for chemical reactions and electronics and all kinds of other things. Um, so that that little mini structure uh, – fits into 60 seconds would not, I mean, I'm sure that I could build it out into a longer form video. That one that I just said, like if it deserves decades of academic research, it definitely deserves uh, a long form video, but um, you can you can share something succinctly uh, and give them that little piece of information and that little bit of optimism in short form. Got it. Um, looking ahead, like what's your huge if true take on YouTube and where... Oh, creators are going like fast forward and in your career like where do you hope to take huge if true i feel like you have so many things that you've done in year one where does this go from here i'm really really excited for people to and it seems like they are really lean into the fact that what youtube offers you is distribution that you control hmm. and so whether that's in my case i'm particularly excited about journalism on youtube and i'm i'm excited to do what i can to support that um but i've also talked to actors who i was speaking with a, a hollywood actor the other day who had a, a sort of more traditional career and then launched a youtube channel and is doing fiction hmm. on youtube hmm. and that that's a wonderful shift. Mm. Like that I think is um, not going to be for everybody, but I think for people who want an opportunity to own their own distribution, I'm very, very excited about the um, that ownership continuing to become a part of more and more industries. Mm. I don't think that that means that any part of YouTube that relates to an industry is going to like take over that industry. Mm. It means that there are more options for those people. There are more options for actors if they also can mm. control their own YouTube channels. There's more options for journalists if they also have their own distribution. Like that doesn't mean that, um, I don't think that needs to be threatening for big institutions that are capable of recognizing how yeah. wonderful that is as long as they're down for like recognizing, um, recognizing that the people that they might want to work with have more options and therefore have more. Mm -hmm. Like I think the people who are creatives and across many different industries should have more power. And that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think that having um, the opportunity to build something on YouTube facilitates that. So for people, whether you want to be a comedian or a chef or a, a journalist, in my case, like I think that having the opportunity to build that career in public on YouTube um, can, can be a real rocket ship for you. Mm. And that's what I think is, I think we've only just barely seen the start of that. That's amazing, Cleo. Well, I'm excited to follow along. I think so much of what you taught, I mean, that, what you just went through, like that is probably the best step-by-step -step process I've seen to making a viral video on YouTube. Thank you. And the way you broke it down with the visuals. Um, I wanted to end by giving you just a, a, something we put together. Uh, we have a, a cartoon newsletter where we illustrate different insights oh. so we made this one for you i'll put it on screen i'll this send it to you as so well cool. um but just you like thinking and being at vox like you know one day and then you just starting huge it's true this is day one and you're making it. it's really inspiring this is really nice thank <laughs> you so much yeah thanks for coming on the show cleo thank you for having me of course all right that's a wrap on cleo all right guys